is the Chief Quality Officer and Senior Vice President at Intermountain Healthcare. He's a world-renowned expert in patient safety and quality improvement and is the Executive Director of the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research at Intermountain Healthcare. I could say a lot of things about Dr. James. I'm very proud to be his employee um, and to have been mentored by him all these years, and I'm sure that you'll have a very good experience today as he talks to you about his sort of leading thinking around um, teamwork. Um, so, Brent, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Savitz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, what I really want to talk about today is something called high reliability. It's a key concept in patient safety. Perhaps to kick the whole topic off, though, um, just a little bit of a framing thing. have a couple of staff standing by. If you have questions or issues um, as the presentation proceeds, we invite you to submit them through the chat box or by raising your hand. Um, staff will forward them to me. I'd like to deal with as many questions as we can as the issues arise, if that's possible, with this large group. Um, I was a member of the IOM Committee on Quality of Healthcare in America. Way back in November of 1999, we published a seminal report called To Air is Human. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It kicked off a movement in healthcare, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, we did an evidence review, found about 60 major papers, all documenting an unfortunate fact. Uh, well, we took a fairly conservative view when we published that somewhere between 44,000 and 98,000 patients died each year in hospitals where the cause of their death was not their underlying disease, but the treatments we used in caring for that disease. And we're still, when we say 44,000 to 98,000 preventable deaths, um, two independent physician reviewers examined each case separately and concluded independently that these deaths were avoidable. They were not necessary deaths. Now, now we recognize that when you're delivering care that you're often walking a very thin line between help and harm. It's almost physically impossible to avoid stepping over. We realized that there was a direct association with the intensity of care, which is, of course, itself associated with the, the advancement of disease. Uh, so, so not all of these cases were losing decades of life or even years. Sometimes it was months or weeks or only days. Only about 25,000 of them were young, healthy people that went in typically for something elective and came out dead. Well, it provoked a long and continuing discussion, but in recent years it's taken a new twist. This is a nice little summary uh, I picked up in truth from Avera Health up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It uh, looked at recent Medicare initiatives, CMS initiatives, uh, really around various forms of pay for quality. Uh, they've listed on the slide six major ones, but I'd like to just mention three that relate particularly to patient safety in one or another degree. Value-based purchasing that started in 2013. Uh, hospital readmission rates also started in 2013. Really our topic for today though is the next to the bottom, hospital acquired conditions. It's going to initiate uh, January 1 next year in theory. Now all of them gradually advance until in 2017 they become fully live. Just to summarize, uh, value-based purchasing, it represents a 2% drop in Medicare payments to hospitals, total Medicare payments around metrics and quality in general. Readmissions is a 3% drop. Hospital-acquired conditions, an additional 1% drop. This is a risk that a hospital bears relative to Medicare payments. Just in passing, uh, with all of those programs, it's about 10% of total Medicare reimbursements. Now, of course, if you perform well, you don't feel the sting of the penalty. This is aligning a financial incentive to things that we should have been doing anyway. Patients' first expectation, they, they should be able to come into a hospital and not worry that they're going to be harmed by their care delivery team harmed by the treatments we use in theory to help them. And that's the point behind this whole argument. Um, I thought to just list out hospital-acquired conditions. Now, 
I'm not going to take full and perfect responsibility for these. Uh, it's a little bit obtuse, frankly, but I think I've got it relatively right here. Um, nine major classes of activities in hospital-acquired conditions. Foreign objects retained after surgery, air embolism, blood product incompatibility, new onset pressure ulcers, stage two to four, vascular catheter-associated infections, patient falls with trauma, poor glycemic control, that really means hypoglycemic episodes, uh, a list of healthcare-associated infections, and I've broken out the four major subcategories. And lastly, frankly, a difficult one, DBT, PE. Now, I'll say in passing, that most of these are, are evaluated through the AHRQ Patient Safety Index System, originally built by Mark McClellan when he was back at Stanford University. We're going to have a little bit more to say about that later, uh, but I believe that that's a list of conditions for which we will be held responsible. Uh, we've got ways, though, of expanding the list. We're going to end up with three layers of this list, and each one is an expansion on the previous one. This is going to relate to methods to manage these conditions coming up in just a moment. So if hospital-acquired conditions, a CMS payment strategy is the core, sentinel and reportable events greatly expand that core. Uh, this one takes uh, several slides, and I had to work hard to try to summarize it in some way. Uh, quite a list associated with death or permanent injury. Now, when you say permanent injury, you have to establish a time point. Uh, when is it considered to be permanent? Uh, for example, in some of the research that we've done around patient safety, we said that an injury resulting in significant physiologic impairment 90 days after the event counted as permanent. Um, obviously, there's a small chance you could still recover, but you do have to establish a time point with each of these. You get a sense of the list, though, death or permanent injury associated with medications, with healthcare acquired infections, with surgery or other invasive procedures, including general anesthesia, any death within 24 hours of hospital discharge, falls or use of restraints, seclusion, or bed rails that results in death or injury, contaminated drugs, devices, or biologics, device malfunctions, electric shock or electroconversion procedures that result in death or injury, um, death or injury associated with labor and delivery, um, maternal injuries as well as infant in injuries, they have a cut point of uh, a minimum infant weight, neonate weight of 2,500 grams to rule out the very small premature. Physical assault within the facility, air embolism, burns incurred from any source while receiving care in a facility, patient disappearance for more than four hours, spinal manipulative therapy, hypoglycemia, communicable disease arising from organ or tissue transplantation, or any other cause not related to expected disease progression. Of course, that's just the start. The list goes on from there. Second biggest category is probably wrong surgery. Uh, wrong surgery means uh, we did the procedure of the wrong patient. Uh, we did the wrong procedure on the right patient. Uh, wrong site surgery, sometimes called wrong site surgery. Interestingly, probably the most common source of injury in this category is wrong anesthesia, where they place that block in the wrong spot or some other problem with anesthesia. And finally, unintended retention of a foreign object. Um, infant care events is another major subcategory. Giving an infant to the wrong person during a stay, discharging the infant to the wrong person, breast milk mix-ups. They also include in this category um, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia of greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter, uh, kernicterus, frankly, resulting in death or harm. I'm sorry, regardless of death or harm. Another category of medicinal gas lines where we get the wrong gas or contaminated toxic substances in a gas line, excessive radiation exposures, you can look at the detail there. Now, interestingly, um, they talk about hospital-acquired stage three or stage four pressure ulcers, but it excludes stage two ulcers documented on admission that then progress to stage three as an exclusion. Um, suicide of an inpatient or within 72 hours of discharge abduction rape, sexual assault, or molestation on facility grounds, uh, impersonators uh, coming into the facility pretending to be a doctor or nurse, processor device failures impacting multiple individuals, so anything that hits more than one person regardless of death or harm, any event potentially exposing administration to criminal charges. <laughs> uh, we're getting pretty general here. 
media-worthy events, um, any other event reported to any regulatory agency. Now, in truth, what I've just shown you is the list of Sentinel reportable events that we track inside Intermountain. It's a little bit of a superset of the events that come straight from the NQF never event list or from Joint Commission Sentinel event list. That's the real core of all of these. I think you'll find though that every health system has a similar list built around the core, usually of Joint Commission and NQF never events, and then perhaps extended out of other things. Now, later I'm going to use a particular term. I'm going to call these sentinel or reportable events. Um, the larger term that we're going to encounter are called serious safety events. And we will expand the core. Interestingly, if you carefully review the research literature around patient safety, uh, more than half, or roughly half, but slightly over, of all patient injuries encountered in inpatient care are adverse drug events, drug overdoses, drug-drug interactions, allergic radiosyncratic reactions, typically. Um, the list that we've just reviewed don't completely contain those. So when I add adverse drug events to serious safety events, it's going to greatly expand the list. We'll see more on that later. Um, the list of hospital-acquired infections or healthcare-associated infections can also be expanded a bit. Soft tissue GI infections not captured in the previous with a special emphasis on methicillin-resistant staph aureus and C. difficile. Um, a further expansion, any event leading to peer review where we feel a need to have peer review of a professional's behavior. Any event found by other review methods, we're going to review of those, a few of those next. Uh, and MERPS categories will come to those two are a way of classifying events. We'll have a chance to review them. For us within Intermountain, at least, we include in this category patient expressions of complaints or concerns, or of course, any lawsuit or claim against our system. So a rather extensive list of patient care events that result potentially in patient harm or risk or exposure to the institution. Um, well, many people ask, when we did to Air is Human, where did we get those estimates of annual mortality? Uh, for those who may not have seen it, I thought it worthwhile to explore the source. I, I mentioned that we found about 60 major articles in the peer-reviewed literature. They started in about 1950 when we started to have effective care in hospitals, and they continued at a fairly constant rate ever since. The two we chose to use, though, are called Harvard Medical Practice Study, HMPS. Uh, that's really the model off which all subsequent patient safety studies seem to have been built. Study con conducted by Dr. Lucian Leaf and Dr. Troy Brennan, uh, both at uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, it was funded by the state of New York and focused on New York State cases. 1984 data, they drew a valid random sample of all hospital discharges in the state of New York for 1984. The sample contained over 34,000 cases. Now, the way they did the study, they trained up a team of nurses who would read through the chart, trained nurses reading the chart, but really what we call implicit criteria looking for anything that they saw as a care defect or a care-associated patient injury. If they thought they found one, that flagged the chart and they'd send it to two separate independent physician reviewers who, without conversation among themselves, had to agree that, number one, the patient was injured. They also asked them to assess whether the injury was avoidable in their professional judgment. This is a source of the preventable statistics. Uh, then they judged whether, in their professional judgment, it was negligent. And Troy Brennan, who is not just a, an internist but a, an attorney, tracked this through the malpractice system, giving us some of the better solid evidence we've ever had on how the malpractice system fails patients in passing. Well, in the original Harvard Medical Practice study, they found that 3.7% of hospitalized patients had at least one care-associated injury. 58% of them were judged to be preventable. Um, now, I've listed here what was in the published literature, 13.6% were life-threatening or fatal. We had the advantage of having Dr. Lucian Leap on the team, so we had access to the raw data. 
Um, that's the source of 98,000 preventable deaths per year. If you take the fatalities that were judged to be preventable, extrapolate them to the country as a whole, it comes to 98,000 preventable deaths per year. Fast forward a few years now, come out to Utah, where Intermountain lives and works. We had a prominent local attorney, a fellow named Elliot Williams, who became greatly concerned about how the malpractice system fails patients. He got a Hartford Foundation grant. He, he proposed, um, well, kind of like workers' compensation, a non-litigious approach to malpractice. He wanted to reroute the roughly half to two-thirds of the money in the malpractice system that currently goes to attorneys and courts. He wanted to reroute that money to patients in needs and greatly accelerate the time frame within which they received help with their injuries. We called it Utah, Colorado because we had to expand to include some hospitals in Colorado to get our sample size up. We're relatively small compared to some place like New York. Oh, the basic method. We had to estimate the injury rate so that we could say what would the payout rate be in this system, get some financial estimates, and we chose to replicate the Harvard Medical Practice Study here in Utah. In fact, Troy and Lucian gave us the loan of one of their, at the time, junior faculty has since gone on to a very, very successful career in patient safety, Dr. Eric Thomas, now down in Houston, Texas, joined us to replicate the study, and I think we got an almost perfect replication. 1992 data, 15,000 charts reviewed. In Utah, we found a 2.9% injury rate. 53% were judged to be preventable. 6.6%, about half the rate, were life-threatening or fatal. Well, if you extrapolated that to the country as a whole, 44,000 preventable deaths per year. So the source of to Arab humans' famous statistics comes from Harvard Medical Practice Study, the 98,000, and a very close replication called Utah, Colorado in 1992. Now, interestingly, the story doesn't end there. That same year, Dr. Uh, Ross Wilson, aided by a very capable nurse, the head of quality at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Australia. Ross and Bernie studied every hospital in Australia. They tried to replicate Harvard Medical Practice Study, the same basic structure, but they didn't have the advantage of Eric Thomas. Uh, they had to do it from the published literature. 14,000 charts, um, same two physician review, same nurse reviewers, I was in Sydney teaching quality with Dr. Wilson and Nurse Harrison when their article appeared in the Medical Journal of Australia, 16.6% injury rate. Talk about a firestorm. Uh, media went wild, politicians on the defense, uh, medical societies trying to explain. Now, anybody who's worked in that system understands that it's not so different from the system we have in the United States. In fact, many of the health professionals train here for training Great Britain. Um, I would be as confident receiving care at Royal North Shore in Sydney as I would at one of our own hospitals here in Intermountain, frankly. Why the difference? Why so much higher? We got Dr. Eric Thomas, the same person who helped us with Utah, Colorado, to come down and examine. We found that the Australians had, had had some different approaches. For example, in Harvard Medical Practice Study in Utah, Colorado, if a patient had an injury in an outpatient setting or injured in another hospital resulting to transfer in, we excluded those cases. We only looked at index injuries, you see, and there were a series of other small differences. But even after correcting for those, it turns out that Australia was still showing twice as high an injury rate. Well, fast forward yet again. A few years later, Bernie Harrison, the nurse who really did the hard work of the study, got a Fulbright Fellowship and came to study in the United States, uh, mostly based here at Intermountain Healthcare at the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research. While here, Bernie replicated the Australian methodology at our flagship LDS hospital. LDS hospital had been a key part of Utah, Colorado. In fact, it had one of the lower rates in the whole study, just over 2%. Strange thing though, when Bernie, looking at the same year's data, replicated the Australian method at LDS, she reported a 10.2% injury rate. A shocking difference, really. Now, I can attest, 
the injuries that Bernie found were real. I was one of her physician reviewers, or as real as they could be. Why the difference? We started to delve into the methods Bernie had used and fairly quickly found a striking difference. I think that we missed earlier during the initial reviews. Oh, it turns out that during Harvard Medical Practice Study in Utah, Colorado, would train nurses to review the initial chart, sent them in to use implicit criteria. Bernie had a long experience as a quality manager at Royal North Shore. She had developed a list of 26 specific sources of patient injury. And then she had built a rule book for how to find them in the chart. So when Bernie's nurses reviewed a chart, it wasn't implicit criteria. It was explicit triggers for review where they looked in specific areas of the chart for specific events. And if they found one, they tracked it back to another part of the chart. Well, wait a minute. I had my answer at least. Um, we've long known in health services research that explicit criteria in general outperform implicit criteria. The implication, we knew we were being conservative with Harvard Medical Practice Study in Utah, Colorado, when the IOM included them into Ares Human. But we had our first estimate of what the true injury rates might really be, and it was about four times higher, roughly four times higher. Um, subsequent studies have occurred in many parts of the world. For example, um, Peter Norton's work in Canada using a modified Australian method, 7.5%. We had studies in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Europe, similar injury rates. Just saw one yet to be published from Argentina, similar injury rates. So we've learned that really the methods we were using might, might need a little bit of, of improvement. Now, background idea. This relates directly to your own work in patient safety. Um, second IOM committee on patient safety upon which I served, we really laid out the method by which you run a measurement system. It consists of three elements for patient safety events. The first is case finding. There you cast the net very broadly. You emphasize sensitivity. Your aim is to not miss any events. Once you've got this more concentrated subset of cases that might be injuries, formal evaluation, hopefully with explicit criteria, there you emphasize specificity. You sift down through those high likelihood cases looking for actual events. And then finally, there's a classification step. You want to store these so that you can analyze them, study them, use them to drive real changes in care. Case finding seems to be the key, though. People down through the years have come up with three main methods for finding potential events. And I've listed them here. The method used worldwide in almost all care delivery settings is something called voluntary reporting, uh, also known as sentinel event reporting. Basic idea, when an event occurs, we ask those involved, the nurse, the physician, perhaps the patient themselves, a family member, to fill out a simple report, these days often on a computer screen, noting that an event may have occurred or actually did occur. That's called voluntary reporting. It's by far the most common method. There's a second method called prospective expert review, and I want to quickly show you that. It's going to teach us some important things. And finally, retrospective chart review. Uh, retrospective chart review happens after the fact, of course, um, but you send a trained nurse in to review the chart typically or some trained individual to review the chart looking for care-associated events. That retrospective chart review is a method that was used in Harvard Medical Practice Study in Utah, Colorado, in the Australian study, uh, every major study since seems to have been based off that method. Just a quick learning experience, so with prospective expert review. It happened first in all the world here at Intermountain Healthcare, our flagship LDS hospital at the time. Uh, Dr. Um, Scott Evans is an informaticist. He worked in the Department of Infectious Disease. They were examining reactions to antibiotics used heavily in infectious disease. Um, the head of the department, John Burick, asked Scott to review our reporting system. Scott quickly came away with the conviction that we were missing most of the actual events occurring within our hospital. We were finding about one every two months. At least that's what was getting reported in the nurse incidents reporting system to voluntary reporting. 
Scott examined it further. He thought that there might be two reasons that people didn't report. One was just the bureaucratic burden. You've already got a problem. It's a busy day to start with. You've got a patient who's now having a reaction to a drug. Life just got busier still. How do you find that 10 or 15 minutes to fill out the report that you're supposed to file? He thought there was a more profound effect, too, pure fear. Did you know that in about a third of the states of this union, if a nurse has more than three adverse drug events recorded on their record in a five-year time period, in theory, at least, they lose their license to practice nursing. It's the belief that these kinds of events arise primarily from incompetence or negligence, um, and it's associated with punishment. So, yeah, many of us who are older have seen it where something happens, and we, of course, care for the patient, but it kind of gets swept under the rug. It doesn't appear in the chart necessarily. It certainly doesn't get in, involved in a, a formal report, you'd hope, uh, at least in that mindset, you see. Scott had that same insight, though, and he said if it's fear that's driving non-reporting, I bet they still care for the patient. And he put together, started to put together, a list of what he called triggers for review. Um, yeah, he could tell when somebody may be treating a care-associated event, in this case an adverse drug event. For example, if a patient has a, an opiate overdose, I have an antidote drug that I can use, naloxone. Um, Narcan. And Scott said, I'll just look for any time someone uses Narcan. Now, they're more refined than I have on the list here on this slide. In the following sense, we routinely use Narcan, naloxone, to counteract the nausea associated with epidural blocks in labor and delivery. But it tends to be mini-dose Narcan, typically a third to a fifth of a normal dose. Well, it means when you use this trigger, you build criteria around it, screening criteria, we automatically screen out cases in labor and delivery at a mini-dose level, you see. Scott now has over 100 of these little screening tools. Some years ago, we had a visiting scientist here at the Institute, Dr. Sam Hens from Zurich, Switzerland, an internist. Um, he had an interest in adverse drug events. He prioritized our list. Um, he discovered that among more than 100 review triggers, the top 14 accounted for 96% of all ADEs discovered in the facility. Um, as you look at the list, you'll notice of the 14, 10 of them are antidote drugs, naloxone, Benadryl, and Napsine, Paragoric, Fumazinil, so on. Uh, three of them are lab tests. Anytime you order a test for CDAF, a ditch level greater than two, uh, doubling of blood creatinine. Only one comes outside of the pharmacy or lab. That's nurse reports of rash or itching. Um, we also list here the true positive rate, even with use of naloxone, with these screen cases, only 22% turned out to be overdoses. Um, gives you some sense of that. Much higher yield, though, much higher yield than if you're just going bare against general case reviews, you see. Well, Scott built the triggers, then ran the system, and we made a startling discovery. He ran it for 18 months, three systems in parallel. During that time period, nurse incidents and reporting found nine confirmed ADEs, or a rate of about six per year, one every two months. Enhanced reporting, he removed the administrative burden for reporting. There's a lesson in here about a reporting system. Um, someone else filled out all the paperwork. The bedside nurse need only flag the chart as a potential event. Uh, the rate increased by an order of magnitude, 60 per year, a little bit more than one per week, about five per month. On the other hand, I call it the help system. Scott had built his detection tool into our electronic medical record, the help EMR. Um, what it would do is fire those triggers, and a, a PhD pharmacist, Dan Postocknik, would take the list each day and visit the patients apply explicit criteria to say, was this a real event or not? Um, what we saw was an almost two order of magnitude increase in rate. In fact, when Scott got the system fully tuned, it wasn't 487 per year, it was about 570. You're seeing this midway through its development. We went from six per year to 570 per year. That's a hundredfold increase. Well, skip forward a little bit more. He had a fellow named Dave Klassen at LDS Hospital who worked heavily in this area. He quit, went to work for First Consulting, helping people install computer systems as an infectious disease specialist, uh, a career that he continues to enjoy and do quite well at. 
well, he wanted to keep his hand in. He managed to collaborate through the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. He connected with Roger Rassar, a physician associated with the Mayo Healthcare System, Luther Middleford in Euclid, Wisconsin. Um, they took that idea of review triggers but applied it to hospital charts, kind of like what Bernie Harrison did at Royal North Shore. Instead of having 26 triggers, though, they discovered 51, validated them, and came up with a formal system for chart review. It was supported by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston that Don Berwick originally founded. They call it the IHI Global Trigger Tool is their name for it. Well, well one day I got a call from Dave, an old friend. He said, you know, we've tested basically every safety thing in the world at LDS Hospital. Could we give it a try? And it just sounded like fun. So with direct financial support from IHI, they flew out a team of nurses and physicians. In a three-day time period, we reviewed 325 randomly selected adult inpatient charts. We pulled them from October of 2004. Now, the thing you need to know, I'm going to share the LDS data where I did the poll. I personally reviewed every chart um, to make sure that this was right and true. This was side by side or after, actually. The IHI team came through. We also involved two other big, famous patient safety hospitals, big academic centers, one in the Midwest, one on the East Coast that I'm not free to name. Those three hospitals were the core of a major article that we published in the Journal of Health Affairs in 2011, summarizing these results. I feel good about sharing the LDS results because there are not significant differences between what I'm showing you and what we put in the article. So it wasn't just us. It was other centers as well. Realized that these were hospitals who were famous for patient safety work. LDS was the source of all of the examples of success that we used in Tara Human, for example. Don't name hospitals, 9 reports, uh, but that's the example we used. Profoundly different findings. It wasn't just over 2% or even 10% um, that we saw. Excuse me for one moment. Something's just popped up. Let me get the slides back up if I can. What in the world's going on here? Ah, the webinar just went away. Are you still on? Yeah, we're still here, Brent. I see the slide. So, uh, give me two seconds. Maybe my, see if it comes back for you. Just died. Uh -oh. My computer just went down. Oh no! Oh no! Two seconds. <laughs> okay. Oh my! Yeah, we're still seeing the slides, so you haven't completely lost us yet. Oh, you are still seeing them? Yeah. Well, I think that's the last one that I was working on. <laughs> I see IHI Global Trigger Tool. All right. So give me one moment, please. Uh, we're going to come back up again, I hope. No problem. So this will take two seconds. My apologies, folks, for the hassle. It wouldn't be a WebEx if we didn't have at least one technical issue. Ah, hate it when this happens. <laughs> Guys, that's my computer restarting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, it's kind of dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brent, do you want me to present the slides from my computer? No, I don't. Just give me two seconds here. Okay. Because I'm almost back in. And I will have to get Amanda to hand me back slide control here. No problem. But here I come in. All right. Ha. Ah. Oh, I'm already presenting. I'm already presenting. All right. All right. Okay. There we go. So everybody can still hear and see the slides? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. We're back on track. The main point. <laughs> We ran the IHI Global Trigger Tool at LDS Hospital on a, on a valid random sample. It wasn't just over 2% of patients who had a care-associated injury. 35.1% had a care-associated injury validated by two separate physicians, um, independently validated. 
just as we described before. Make sure that we have this working. I'm just uh, fixing one more thing on my computer, folks. My apologies. Um, so let me go back to here. Excuse me, I'll be right back. So Amanda, am I back online where people can hear me again? We can hear you. I you look like you lost your presenter privileges, so I've just reassigned them to you. I think you need to share your slides again. All right. Let me see if I can share. And and just as a time check, Brent, you've got about twenty five more minutes left. Yes. Uh, Amanda, unless I'm missing the box, it's still not allowing me to share. Hmm, okay. Ah, there we go. Right. I've redone it again, so hopefully we weren't cross-purposes there. It says I'm a panelist now, so it's still oh, not sharing. Presenter. Oh, here ah, you go. Now I'm the presenter. You got Sorry, it. Brent. Uh, no, no problem. Sorry for the snafu, guys. Wouldn't you know this is a lecture about high reliability and this happens. So <laughs> there you go. Um, All right, we're back have, with the slides. Ah, uh, great. Well, it turns out that 26% of those injuries happened in an outpatient setting and resulted in hospitalization. A very interesting finding, 9.1% of all hospital admissions at those three big hospitals, the cause of admission was a care-associated injury deriving from outpatient care. Uh, I believe that's the first time this statistic was ever discovered. More accurately, when you remove those cases, look at injuries during the index hospitalization, 26% were during the index hospitalization. You see a breakout down here by what are called MERPS categories. Now, MERPS E, the patient, it was a temporary event. Often the patient doesn't even know they had an event, but it required intervention, usually treatment, uh, like an antidote drug. Another 33% prolonged hospitalization, additional observation. So 86% of the injuries only really affected cost, uh, but they can drive up costs quite dramatically. For example, today, uh, surgical site infection, uh, moderate or severe, typically the cost for treating the infection is over $10,000. I'm sorry, over $30,000. The cost for treating an adverse drug event when you get the severe ones in averages close to 10. Well, 86% of the injuries were just cost-related. 3% MERPS-G patients suffered permanent harm. We set our cut point at 90 days. Most of them was for the rest of their life. 7% MERPS age. Uh, this event would have killed the patient if we didn't intervene rapidly and vigorously, but we did. We were able to stave off uh, the terrible uh, for merely the bad. 1.2% of the time, the patient died from their treatment in a way that two independent physicians said the cause of death was the treatment. Now, we didn't directly measure estimates of preventability. The reason for that, uh, we don't think we can tell accurately. We want to be able to attack on all of them. This is based on evidence again. Um, oh, if you extrapolate that ahead, I'm going to mention that in just a moment. It turns out that preventable death rates associated with patient safety in hospitals around the world is much higher than we initially estimated. So some updated learnings, some things you need to know. 
Yeah, what I'm referring to is a paper published by John James, no relation, more recently last year in the Journal of Patient Safety. He took mainly our Health Affairs article and some other sources as well and said the real death rate is not 98,000 preventable deaths per year in the United States, but 200,000 preventable deaths per, per year in the United States, where the cause of death was care associated for inpatients alone. Uh, we believe that there is a significant burden with outpatient as well. We've never been able to measure it. Now, next thing you really need to know, yeah, during this study, we did a formal evaluation of other injury detection tools. So at LDS Hospital, we had 173 detected events by all methods. Um, my personal review, the IHI Global Trigger Tool, a second method based on discharge abstract records, electronic data called Utah, Missouri, HRQ PSIs, this is the standard for safety measurement in the country. Um, we evaluated that to it too, runs off discharge abstract data, electronic discharge abstract data. We looked at concurrent triggers just for ADEs, uh, infection concurrent triggers that we were running here at Intermountain. Interestingly, among 173 events, sample event reporting found exactly zero, none of them. Uh, as important, look at HRQ PSIs. Of 173 events, PSIs found 10 of them. This is across the entire system now. It's not looking at specific sub-indexes. That's a 5.8% true positive rate. Of the 13 events PSIs found in this patient cohort, three of them were false positives. That's a 23.1% false positive rate. So I've, uh, I've really enhanced or emphasized that here. You need to think about this. Um, you will want to work on your discharge coding practices. Um, as you look at hospital-acquired conditions, um, one of the main driver measurement systems behind it is PSIs. This is not directly applicable because they use sub-indexes within it. And here we're evaluating PSIs overall. We're not evaluating the individual sub-indexes, but it's a big deal. Uh, another follow-on, voluntary reporting at best finds about 1% to 10% of actual injuries. Um, if you're relying on voluntary reporting, you're not beginning to see the full truth of injury rates within your facilities. Another way of looking at it, this came out of this same IHI Global Tr Trigger Tool study. Roger Rassar and I went through just for fun. We broke out those events that should have been a sentinel event report, so class two sentinel event reporting. Then we extrapolated to a full year at LDS Hospital. We could do that because it was a valid random sample. We estimated that LDS Hospital should have reported 132 sentinel events during that year. Of course, there were zero found within the study itself. That whole year, LDS Hospital reported nine. One of my students now runs the event reporting system for the state of Utah. That year, LDS had the best reporting system in the state. The whole state only reported 36. And a quarter of them were from LDS Hospital See the differences there, though? Now, an interesting sub-factor in this, and you're going to have to struggle with this, I suspect, the best hospitals have the highest reported rates. You can't fix what you can't find. This is a bit of a challenge, isn't it? You have to, you have to decide you want to look good. That's regulatory compliance, reported rates that might be appearing in the newspaper on, on the nightly news, let's say, or do you want to be good? You want to run care that's actually safe for your patients. Realize that being good means big money, not just the hospital-acquired conditions and the financial incentives that Medicare is placing upon us. That runs on that regulatory reporting system that does so poorly. It's in terms of the cost of care within your own facility. Now, a key takeaway, if you're going to measure patient safety events accurately, you're going to need three parallel systems. You'll need systems like Scott Evans. Um, Scott systems, those concurrent clinical trigger systems, means that you can intervene on the fly as an injury occurs. You may not be able to stop the initial injury, but you can stop the harm. Uh, that's well documented. Um, we published for AHRQ some years ago out of the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research concurrent trigger systems for adverse drug events, hospital acquired infections, and pressure injuries are three most common causes of injuries in the world today. And we did it at three levels. 
for someone who has a fully automated EMR, it can operate at that level. Semi-automated, where you're using computer systems that don't talk to each other directly, but one in the pharmacy, one in the lab. And then if you don't have any of those tools, that you can run at a completely manual level. This is accessible to anybody. Then the next big piece, the current state-of-the-art in head-to-head -head trials, IHI Global Trigger Tool, it's worth implementing. There's a little bit of an investment in it, it's surprisingly small, but it will give you a true handle on your actual injury rates. You will need voluntary reporting in order to enhance something called a culture of safety. Now, I'm going to ask you to be thoughtful as you build these things. As you build them, make sure that you follow the reporting regulations tightly. You'll discover that most of the events that you detect, you're not required to report them in the regulatory environment. You could if you choose, but you're not required. And I'm going to suggest to you that you should use the regulatory system the way it was created according to the mandates placed upon all of us. You use it the way that we're directed to use it. So you'd probably be reporting only a few events in the regulatory system compared to what you're finding internally. You see, if, if you have that larger internal grab, you'll discover that you can drop your rates overall. It gives you the grist for the mill to make effective interventions on patient safety. But you're going to have to think of these in two buckets within your mind. A second takeaway, and this is an important one as you move ahead, um, work of Scott Evans again. He tracked adverse drug events. He was also tracking medication delivery errors. Across an eight-year time period, over 200,000 consecutive inpatients, 4,155 human errors in preparing or delivery medications. In that time period, we had 3,996 confirmed ADEs. This is at one hospital. The fascinating thing, 3.5% of the actual patient injuries, the adverse drug events, 138 of them, 3.5%, tracked back to a human error. The other 96.5% were classic system failures. The takeaway, focus on events, not errors. If you focus on errors, it's going to drive your thinking down a path toward the 3.5%. It will greatly limit your effectiveness. Think of it more broadly than that. Will you occasionally find true errors, even professionals where you need to intervene? Yes, but it will be relatively rare your real leverage is going to come at a different level. Can I show you that? This is a classic example. It comes from Dr. David Pryor, the Chief Quality Officer at Ascension Health System, over 110 Catholic hospitals scattered across the United States that work on these things together. Now, he focused on the regulatory component. So this isn't the broader component. This is a regulatory component. I would argue that that's a legitimate starting point, is to start on that regulatory component. The government demands that we do it. It's our public face. Well, what this shows is is a voluntary reporting system back here at the start. It's a voluntary reporting system. Focus on the red line. That's his serious safety event rate, so it's the broader definition. Well, the way David had it set up, it's really what I just showed you as Category 2. It's a central event reporting. Um, yeah, he put in place a better tracking system and saw a sudden increase in detected rates. He says his actual true rate was about 1.6 events per 10,000 equivalent patient days. Then he started to implement a particular method, uh, and it dropped his true SSE rate as measured at Ascension uh, dramatically. Um, he had set a goal to reduce it by 25%. Instead, he reduced it by about 75%, uh, down to 0.562 events per 10,000 equivalent patient days. This is what you report to the regulators. This is what will drive healthcare-associated conditions. So the question is, how did he do it? It turns out it was a system approach. Um, it relied upon well-defined, fully reported management actions accountable through the organization up to the Board of Trustees. It had a far more rigorous event measuring system, but it was still voluntary reporting. It's still probably missing, to my estimate, 9 out of 10 of the real events that you could work on in the broader view that we talked about. Oh, what was it? It was, well, system-wide team leadership, followership training. The thing you need to know, this is the only method to date that has shown evidence for dramatically reducing 
sentinel event reporting, other reported event rates, what we're calling SSEs or sentinel events within our discussion today. I should say in passing, in fairness, that Ascension got its start with a group that grew out of the nuclear regulatory industry uh, called HPI, focuses on high reliability. Um, a number of others have started with that group. They eventually reach a scale point where they have to pull it internal and do it on their own, at least as an external observer of this whole thing. Well, in that setting, we had a parallel activity that was happening here at Intermountain Healthcare. It's called 100% Participation. It's a way of driving out quality improvement methods to an entire workforce. Intermountain has about 34,000 employees, so many that I can't begin to get them all through a classroom. Frankly, I can't even keep up with turnover within that workforce in the classes that I run, despite spending more than half of my time having a major subdivision of the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research. That's all we do. Um, barely keep our head above water on this one. Well, we had an idea. It's called a flipped classroom. Rather than spending face-to-face -face time to do the instruction, what if you took the content, concentrated it down, very high information content, and programmed it onto a DVD? Now, we discovered something from learning theory. It turns out that highly trained, deeply dedicated, really smart human professionals, we appear to have about a 10 to 12 minute attention span. Uh, we need a break of some sort. Um, in order to, to really focus on a topic. We made those DVDs a maximum of 10 to 12 minutes long, reflecting that learning theory. Very high information content, very high video production values. You can do some really nice things with videos and with embedded exercises, hands-on experiences. Oh, the real key, though, to using the method, this is the key. We experimented for more than three years to figure it out, frankly. You have to have a debrief. You have to have your end users watch the DVD on their own. You then debrief them as a group. The debrief is led well in lean jargon. It's called a coach, but it's a true topic expert. Um, for my 100% participation quality improvement DVDs, I need a, a black belt to lead the debrief, um, the coaching exercise. Of course, with the DVDs, we brought back them up with very strong supplementary materials, um, not just the full text of the DVDs so that you can read as well as watch and listen, um, but also uh, enhancing supplementary materials to the side uh, just to make the, the content more rich. We also have a coach's manual that teaches our coaches how to coach and suggests questions they might ask, exercises they might do. Well, that coach reviews the concepts, addresses direct questions, and helps with exercises. An interesting thing, we found that when we've done this, our face-to-face -face time, the time that people have to be away from work in that session, it fell by about a factor of three or four. And interestingly, we got several layers deeper in understanding than if we had a regular classroom. Well, under Dr. Savitz's Hen Grant, we committed to create a similar set of DVDs for team leadership followership training. We pulled a, together a, a core group of true experts on the topic, uh, the real leading lights in this field, at least our eyes around the country. Dr. James Bajan, a pilot, a NASA astronaut, served on so, several shuttle missions. Um, he led the VA's exemplary effort on patient safety under Ken Kaiser's original leadership. He continues to teach those methods and has showed similar, stellar patient safety results at the University of Michigan Medical Center, where he currently works. John Nance is a face you may have seen on TV. Anytime there's an airline disaster, ABC News uses him as their primary expert. He's a military and civilian airline pilot. Uh, he helped create these methods in aviation that makes it safe to fly author of several important texts on the topic, Why Hospitals Should Fly, for example, and many other interesting novels just in passing. He's a prolific writer. Dr. Don Kennerly leads a successful program at Baylor Scott & White, uh, now based out of Dallas, Texas, has some real hands-on experience. We have many other advisors as well, for example, uh, Ascension's Dr. David Pryor, who had such successes in this area. It's actually still a relatively short list. Um, but we've been able to identify those individuals and tap into them for help, um, technical experts uh, on a much more extensive basis. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the content of the thing. 
Section one's an introduction. These slides are really busy, I apologize. But they lay out, um, without sufficient detail, <laughs> it's a slide, uh, the basic run of the thing. It starts with a classic harm story, a chemotherapy event at Intermountain in which the patient died, just a classic patient safety event. It makes the point that healthcare delivery regularly achieves miracles, but anything that powerful, is powerful enough to heal can also harm. Now, on each of these, the outline calls for us to review the evidence. Um, why do we believe this? And at least references in to the scientific evidence. Point out that these injury events can be devastating, not just to patients, but also to healthcare professionals, of course, with a primary focus on patients with illustrations. A key finding from the research liter literature, any time highly trained humans work in complex settings, these kinds of events are inevitable. Um, it is possible, though, to study patterns of failure with a good data system and then design care delivery settings that make it easy to do it right. We know that this can produce dramatic drops in injury rates. Many of these safety skills link to human behaviors, what are called non-technical skills at the sharp end. Now, they're ephemeral. If you think about using this kind of a tool, it's not just that you have to train your entire workforce at the get-go. You then have to maintain that training on a regular basis, now and forever, into the future. This is going to be an important idea. Um, yeah, the trouble is these safety skills are not yet routinely taught in current health professional training. And the idea uh, is in all of these that all are accountable to make care safe, not just the physicians and nurses, not just the administrators, the food services people, uh, the people who clean the building, anybody who works in our facilities, their first job should be patient safety. Well, section one, hopefully on a single DVD, it looks like we can get it on a single, um, an introduction to launch the topic. Section two focuses on team leadership. This will end up being two to three DVDs. First, the idea that patients come first. Um, make the case that in a complex environment, team skills are as important as technical skills. Um, Non-technical skills are as important as technical skills. Um, and that a high reliability organization regularly trains and retains team skills, what we just mentioned. We also objectively assess knowledge and performance. So for example, at performance level, you have to build in something like a 360 survey routinely. And we believe that eventually this will become part of professional credentialing. For that surgeon, it's not just how good they are in the OR, it's are they capable of leading a team. Same thing that we see in military aviation, for example, that that team leadership skill is critical to success. Now, the point is, is that everyone will sometimes find themselves in both roles, sometimes as a team leader and often as a team member, so you have to be facile in both roles. Also, if you have a knowledgeable team member base, it helps hold the leaders on track. Well, the key idea, a team leader has a fiduciary responsibility to engage the eyes, ears, and minds of every member of the care delivery team. Now, within that, the key factor is something called an authority hierarchy. What makes it easy for people to appropriately speak up? Um, how do you handle problems as they arrive? We'll define what authority hierarchies are, lists or subtypes, describe contributing factors. John Nance has a beautiful list of illustrations from aviation, uh, plus some others that we will probably add. We'll then describe the team leadership tools um, that a, an effective leader might use, a particular focus on briefings, checklists, and debriefings, so specific skills. A major part are communication skills from the leadership view. Warning signs when communications are breaking down, specific techniques to use in those settings. And then finally, this is the proper place to talk about what's called target lock, where a group of professionals focuses in on one sub-element and misses the larger picture, it gets so focused on one tree they lose the forest with the sometimes devastating results, how to, to recognize when it's coming and how to manage it. I'm a little bit out of time. You need to know that there's a, a similar section a series of DVDs, I'm guessing three at this point of the outline on team membership. And finally, there's a major section um, on managing high reliability. Well, with that, we're committed to build these DVDs. We have a leadership team. We have the basic outlines done are just starting to generate text um, for actually producing the DVDs. Why a DVD? Why would that be important? Well, first of all, it gives you standard training, uh, an observation. When you have a cadre of perhaps 200 trainers across the system of size of Intermountain, training can show a high degree of variability. 
uh, some are gifted, some are not. Uh, it might be just a bad day, in fact. Well, with a DVD, you can get uniform, very high levels of instruction. A second major reason, the way the DVDs are constructed, they can be customized to a local environment. We green screen them so you can change bits and pieces, and they can be systematically updated based upon experience. Um, it contains materials for that coaching function to support coaches, so you get a consistent educational setting that then plays across time. And lastly, it tends to greatly reduce the amount of investment an organization has to make in the training function for both the instructors and for the participants. With that, I think we're short of time, so let me wrap up and say, do we have any time for a few questions, Dr. Savitz? I, I believe we're out of time right now, Brent, but one of the things we can invite folks to do, if you do have questions, you can send them via email to admin at henlearner, all one word, H-E-N-L-E-A-R-N-E-R, dot -E -E org, and, and we can process those questions for you. We've also been monitoring the chat box. Um, at the peak, we had um, 104 people on the line. That's just connections, so many more people. And so we'd really like to thank you, Dr. James, for being with us today and laying out the groundwork and thinking um, as we move forward from high reliability into team leadership and followership. And we'll look forward to those DVDs. Thank you. Thank you. Good day to you. Good day.